Okay, I think we can get started. Probably people uh, might still join us if they're a little bit late. So we'll just have people come in. That's perfectly fine. I would like to uh, welcome you very much to this uh, workshop on uh, Dataverse, Dataverse training. My name is Ricarda Brauchmann and I work at Dance and I'm hosting this workshop together with my colleague Kim Ferguson, who's also at Dance. I hope you can hear us well and see us well. If you have any problems, let us know in the, in the chat. And yeah, we will have a short introduction. So I will get right into uh, what we're gonna do today. So at this uh, Train the Trainer uh, workshop, we have um, basically two parts with a lunch break in between. So um, we have now first a bit of a welcome, um, giving an introduction to the day of today. Then uh, we will start with a presentation that will give a bit of background on Dataverse. We assume that most of you are familiar with Dataverse, but we want to give a brief introduction of what it is and what you can use it for. Um, we will have some short breaks in between just to get some coffee. And then we have two sessions uh, where we will work on creating a training for Dataverse. So in the first session that we have before lunch, we will present some example materials and workshop outlines that we have created for you um, that you can use. Uh, then we will have and you will have an hour lunch break, uh, get some time to stretch your legs, have some food, go outside, and then we'll come back for a session where you will be working on your own uh, workshop design using the materials that we have been providing for you. So this is a session where you can really think about what do I want to do for my own community. Um, and then after that, we have a third session where we'll talk a bit more about planning and troubleshooting of a workshop, and then we'll wrap up and should be done by around three. Um, there should be a lot of room for questions. So if you have questions, let us know. Um, yeah, and um, feel free to raise your hand or speak up. Uh, we are relatively, uh, or, or the groups that we have about 30 people, I think. So it's a it's a group size that I think we can manage if people want to ask questions directly. And we'll also for the uh, the second session, we will work into break break in breakout rooms where we have even more time to talk uh, to each other. So a couple of housekeepings. Uh, the presentation will be recorded, um, the gallery view. So it's also recording now. So if you do not want to be on video, you can turn off turn off your camera. Uh, we will pause the recording during the breakout sessions because these are mainly used for discussions, so the discussions will not be recorded, uh, but the presentations will be so that anybody who is interested can watch it later. Uh, we also would ask you to mute, mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, you can raise your hand, as I already said, if you have any questions, or you can post them in the chat. We have um, captions uh, that you can turn on, which will be automatically generated in English, so this is a feature in Zoom that you can use if it's easier for you to follow the presentations. Um, and as my colleague Kim has emailed all of you, we have prepared a package of materials that you can download in Zenodo. And if you haven't done that yet, I would recommend that you download the materials from the link. I will post it in the chat now as well, uh, because this, is, um, this contains the presentation, including this presentation, but also the presentations and materials that you can use later on during the day. So everything can be found there and um, we'll, we'll provide the link later as well. But if you haven't done it yet, I think I would recommend that you um, download the, the material, materials. So then it would be nice to get to know each other a little bit. So um, we prepared a short Menti questionnaire. Um, the number is different than, the, than it was in the presentation that we uploaded to the Zenodo. So if you have that one, then uh, please disregard the number and go to this one. So you can use menti.com and then use the number 62593440. And then I will switch my screens so we can go to the Menti. Let me see. And I see people are coming in. So hopefully you should now uh, be able to see my screen. Yes, I think so. So the first question that we have is, which country are you joining us from today? And we wanted to just see where people are coming from. So I see quite some people from the Netherlands, which makes sense because dance is, of course, the Dutch Institute. We'll talk a little bit more about dance and its Rowan Sester also in a minute. 
but I also see some people from uh, quite a lot of different countries, which is very nice. And I see 17 people are in there. Let us know if you have problems accessing the Menti. Can you write a code in the chat? Yes, Kim has put the code in the chat. Thank you, Kim. And I see 20 people have joined. Great. Just give it a little bit more time before I continue to the next question. Nice. So we see we have quite an international audience with quite some people from the Netherlands, which is very nice. Um, we'll have a little bit of time later on to also discuss what audiences you focus on in your training and what you would like to know more. So let's see if I can do this. Yes, then we were interested in what your position is, so what, uh, what you're currently doing at your institution. So that's the next question in the Menti. So what would you say your position is, Ricarda? So my position is data station manager, which is probably a bit, uh, a bit of a sounds special. fancy. It sounds very fancy. It sounds very. And you, Kim? <laughs> uh, I'm a research data management specialist. Also very nice. Mm -hmm. I think we see some of this also coming back here. So I see data managers, data stewards quite a lot, which is nice because that was also our our target audience, let's say, but I also see data archivists and research associates, an assistant professor I see, and research assistants as well. So a lot of research and research data, which is assistant nice. Assistant professor. Oh, director. Yeah. Wow, hello. Great. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. And also I see some developers, fair, fair data stewards. So I think we should probably all be fair data stewards in a way. <laughs> Great, this is good to know because it gives us a bit of an idea of what your background is and also to see uh, which community we have, um, yeah, we have gathered today. So this is really nice um, because we are, we are in a train the trainer event. We are really excited that we have a lot of data stewards here who hopefully can use this to educate their, um, uh, yeah, at the universities or uh, the researchers about database and how to use it to archive and find data. Great, then let's go to the next question. This is working, yes. So we wanted to know for which audience uh, you plan to provide trainings and we're giving you a couple of um, options. So whether you do it for researchers, data supporters, both or other. And we're interested in this because we will have breakout rooms later in the day and we can target them or we can group you um, according to the audience that you would like to um, to teach for. So we wanted to know a little bit sort of what people think they will be doing. So I see quite a lot of researchers or both, which is interesting. And I see somebody saying other and more people saying yeah. others. So if you want to tell us what other audiences you have, I think that would be really useful. You can either unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat if you like. But it seems so. Well, most we can give a bit of a delay. <laughs> we have a bit of a delay. Okay. Let's yeah, see. yeah. So you have to decide: mm, Do I want to unmute or do I want to type it in the chat? Mm. But I see. So a lot of us are including researchers, either only researchers or researchers and data stewards. So I think this is this is good for us to know. Um, and only two people say other. So that's also I think nice. So we may we may want to then focus on uh, researchers and data stewards, which I think is nice. Mm -hmm. So if uh, people still want to put in uh, some comments in the chat about which other target audiences you have for your trainings, I think that would be would be great. Um, you can also see that we assume that everybody here is giving a training, which might not necessarily be the case. I know some people have contacted us if they can just join for information. That's also perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, so this is good to know. And also, yeah, we'll talk about it a bit more sort of how we can meet the, the target audiences in different ways. Mm -hmm. The next question is, which topics do you, do you cover or do you plan to cover in your trainings? And again, we've given you a couple of options.
Okay, interesting. So there's a bit of a divide there. Okay, so I see that not so many people say other again. So if you want to put other information in um, into the chat as well, if you have comments, then let us know. And the other topics seem to be relatively uh, distributed. So I see less on metadata. Okay, thanks, Joost, for sharing this. Um, that's interesting that you are also giving training some metadata because they will come back. So we have um, we have some training materials where this will also be covered, I think. And I think I'm also uh, glad to see that data versus technology is something that is covered a little bit less and archiving and publishing data is, is sort of the most interested because that's also what we're focusing on the most. So we will give a little bit of background on data versus technology, uh, but not in a sort of very detailed way. So I think this is good that this reflects um, this reflects the audience. Uh, although we also want to encourage people that if you have questions, you can post them here. And even if we cannot answer them today, we will try and answer them later. So this is nice, gives us a good overview of what, what people are interested in. All right, let me see. Uh, yeah, the last question for this introduction is, what would you like to learn today? Are there specific things you would like to get out of this workshop? Is there anything um, yeah, that you think if I can learn this, then I will be going, um, going home tonight and having the idea that I achieved what I wanted to? So this is an open question. Again, just for us to see if we what we've planned for today is appropriate and if we should tailor it to a little bit more. OK, somebody says data versus metadata publication opportunities. So this also relates, I think, to what you said, that they are also giving training on metadata. So that's interesting. Um, good practice and other new ideas on how to provide audio and training. Best practices organizing data version in L instance in the context of RDM. OK, we will talk a little bit about data version L in a way. OK, and I see a lot of things coming in. Mm -hmm. So how to provide data management training in general, how to structure training, and yeah, we will have a little bit of information on that later. How to teach and motivate researchers. Can I scroll down? I'm not sure if I can. Oh, it's scrolling by itself, I think. I hope. <laughs> How to build uh, up an RDM workshop. Interesting. Also, archive in a box. Yeah, that's also interesting. Everything there is to know about Dataverse. Well, <laughs> I'm we not will, sure we will you in the right that. direction of where to go for that, I think. Everything, yeah. though. I think we're not going to cover everything, so that's nice. Yeah. Uh, details and ideas on authorization and data access, okay? So what we'll do today is we will provide you with a lot of materials that I think if you're interested to learn more, you will find ways of getting extra information. Because what we'll do is, is sort of give a basic overview, but also provide you with materials that you can use later on. So for instance, if you wanna have a, a workshop tailored on metadata, I think you will get some, some materials that you can broaden that um, for your own workshop later. Okay, but I hear, I see a lot of data which is great. Uh, I see best practices, strategies to make people enthusiastic. Well, I think that's, that's what we all want to do. Great. And I can say Philip in the chat says, it's good to see Dataverse seems to be so popular. Yeah, thanks, Philip. <laughs> Since our workshop focuses on Dataverse, we were also hoping to get the community, but I have to say that I'm really excited also how many people showed interest because we were, we were doubting whether it would be um, a large enough group, but I think it's really nice to see that a lot of us are using Dataverse. So hopefully, uh, yeah, we can help each other there and also share ideas and materials for that. So that's great. Good, nice. You can still keep uh, adding things if you want to, but I think I want to switch back to my presentation because I think this is the last slide. So I'm going to switch back to my presentation so we can continue with the program. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to share. Um, 
share this again. So you should hopefully okay. all again see my presentation. We are seeing your presentation mode. You see my presentation mode. That was not the idea. Let I me think uh, if you go back to it, you can hit swap displays and it'll be fine. That should be fine. I can also do this. This should also be fine. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thanks for letting me know. It's always a struggle with these things. Great. So now that we have a bit of an idea um, of sort of the audience that we have, uh, I wanted to just briefly say a little bit about what we will cover in this workshop and what we won't cover, just to give you an idea of uh, what you can expect. So what we will cover is the basic introduction to Dataverse. Um, and also we will give you overview of materials that you can reuse for training. And the training materials that we have today will focus on Dataverse, on data discovery and data archiving. Um, we will also talk about ways how you can plan your training. And we will uh, dis have a discussion on tips on how to deal with unforeseen circumstances. So it's really about how do you create your trainings? What are some basic materials? And what can you do to make sure your training is well organized and sort of well structured? What we will not cover is uh, detailed technical information about Dataverse. Um, as I said, if you have questions, you can you can ask them and we will try to answer them as best as possible, but there might be other places to go for that. Uh, we also here want to already mention the Dataverse user guide that has a lot of information and also the Dataverse user community where a lot of technical questions can be asked. Um, we will also not talk about guidelines on Dataverse installations um, or the newest Dataverse developments, uh, as well as external tools that are related to Dataverse. So there's a lot you can do uh, from a data archiving perspective with Dataverse, a lot of features and functionalities. We will broadly cover what, what you can do, but we will not go into detail of the technical aspects. So um, yeah, back, back on our Dataverse. Um, so Dataverse, uh, as probably many of you know, is an open source uh, research data repository software. So it's open source software and it's developed by Harvard Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences. They started developing it in 2006, um, but the community really started growing in the, in the past years a lot. Um, there is a global Dataverse community consortium that is supporting the development of Dataverse. Uh, and um, yeah, so this really has been this growing community that supports the software. And Dataverse can be used to share, prever pre preserve, cite, explore, and analyze research data. So it's a software that a lot of data archives use, um, data repositories, and also in the Netherlands, a lot of universities use it for their institutional repositories. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about that later as well, also how we use it at DANS. Um, you can find Dataverse up at uh, dataverse.org. And um, yes, that's a bit of general background. Um, Dataverse has many installations. At uh, the time that I was looking at this, which was a couple of weeks ago, it had 83 installations all over the world. So you can see that uh, a lot of them are based either in the US, North America, and in Europe as well. So we have quite some installations also in the Netherlands, um, but it's really spreading all over the world. And the community consortium is, is very much growing uh, in the past couple of years. So it might be that if you look at the website now, there might even be a couple more already. So um, just to tell you a little bit about uh, Dataverse and how we use it at DANCE and also give you a bit of background on what DANCE is. So DANCE uh, stands for Data Archiving and Network Services. And we are a Dutch national center of expertise and a repository for research data. So in general, DANCE promotes fair data and uh, open science and research data management in the Netherlands. And we are also the SESTA service provider for the Netherlands. So SESTA is the consortium of European social science data archives and is also the context in which we're organizing this workshop because many SESTA service providers like DANCE are using Dataverse as a repository software. So DANCE offers data archiving services for individual researchers and for institutes. And we also offer advice and training on research data management, fair data and open science. And in terms of how we use Dataverse ourselves, 
uh, we have um, data stations that individual researchers or projects or also institutions can use to upload uh, data sets. And we are in at the moment uh, transitioning from our old uh, archiving system, which was called EASY, into a system that uh, uses Dataverse and also has domain specific metadata. So we have these data stations and I myself am uh, responsible for the social sciences and humanities data station. Um, and we are, we are at the moment transitioning from this old system that we have to fully using Dataverse. So that is how we are using Dataverse at the moment for our own archive and our own repository. And we also have a service that I, I think many of you are familiar with, the people from the Netherlands, um, which is called Dataverse NL. And Dataverse NL is a service that we offer for institutes that want to set up their own repository. So in Dataverse NL, DANCE provides the technical environment of Dataverse, but the universities can really decide how they want to um, how they want to create the repository and how the Dataverse instance for their own institute should look like. So there we do not uh, we do not prescribe sort of which metadata fields to use or which structure to use, but this is really for the repositories themselves. And this was something we started because there was a growing need for universities and other institutes to have their own data archives and data repositories. So this is a, a consortium that we have been building over the past years. And what ANS is really doing the technical infrastructure. But we're hoping that also for the data personnel community, this workshop will be useful um, to get an inspiration on how you can train your own researchers in using and using Dataverse and your own Dataverse repository uh, in, in this uh, context. Um, so a little bit more about, about SESTA. I already mentioned DANS is the Dutch service provider of SESTA. And SESTA is the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. So it's, um, it's a collaboration of a lot of uh, European archives working with social sciences data. So it's uh, cross European and we work on discovering resources across Europe, but also uh, looking at the quality of data and metadata. So SESTA develops a lot of standards and a lot of vocabularies, for instance, that can be reused. Um, we also have a, a data catalog where metadata from dance and from the Netherlands is collected and then uh, findable in a, in a cross Europe catalog. SESTA also uh, supports the certification of archives. Um, many of you who have a university uh, repository or an own repository at your data archive might know that there's a certification system and the quarter seal being a relevance uh, there that basically shows that uh, an archive has certain standards to which they comply and SESTA is helping archives to achieve that standard. Uh, we also within SESTA provide a lot of training activities like this one where we try to um, share knowledge with the community and help others um, mainly within the social sciences but some, some of this is more broader context. And um, SESTA also is involved in data access and analysis projects and also is trying to broaden its scope across Europe. And this, um, on this map, you can see the, the 12, 22 members and also some of the partners that are involved in SESTA. So just a question for you, Ricarda. Yes. From Aneta. What is considered a Dataverse installation? Because you mentioned that there were 83. So what is an installation? That's a good question, actually. I'm not sure what they count. So I think if you install your, uh, if you install Dataverse and use it as a repository, I'm sure I think that would be counting as an installation. So I'm guessing it's an up and running Dataverse. So the Dataverse and all of the partners would be their own installation, I would assume. But it's a good question. I'm not sure what they exactly count. It's a very good question. And then there's another question. Uh, from Philip, which Philip, you have just asked a very controversial question here, Dance. Um, in English, there seems to be a clear cut distinction between the terms repository for publishing and archive for long term preservation. In Norwegian, we actually just use the term archive or archive for both. Ricarda, do you have any thoughts or comments on this? I know personally within CESDA, we've discussed it for the data archiving guide that we're working on. We just use both interchangeably because of this kind of translation issue, but Ricarda, thoughts? 
Yeah, that's a good question as well. And I also noticed that I use both interchangeably. So I think for today, I would use them interchangeably, but there has been a discussion whether an archive is something that is sort of more focused on the actual archiving, so sort of long-term preservation of data, whereas the repository might more be sort of a collection of, of data where not so much curation is happening. So I think different people have different views on this. Um, personally, I think for today, we'll just keep it as an interchangeably, in, in, uh, keep it as interchangeably uh, or interchangeable terms. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so in a way what, where we often make a difference and that will come back also in, in some of the materials is that we make a difference between uh, archives that are certified, so that have a core trust seal certification and those that do not. And I think that's a more, um, that is I think more and more important distinction rather than sort of having a discussion on terminology, but it is, uh, it is, it is a good question. It's something that we have been talking about. And I, th I saw, I saw Philip also mentioned the dataverse analysis and installation. So I don't, I don't know what counts as installation. I would have to look that up. It's a, it's a good question. We'll try and come. Hey, we can, we can look it up at lunch. <laughs> yeah, we can look it up during lunch when, when something is an installation indeed. Because as probably many of you know, uh, I haven't I haven't said it yet, but I wanted to say it in minutes, so I might as well say it now. So in Dataverse, you can have sort of sub dataverses, which is basically you can see it like a folder in a folder, and then the question is what counts as sort of the main installation? Um, because in Dataverse now we have Dataverse now, and then every university can have their own Dataverse within it. So then indeed the question becomes when what is what counts as an installation? But yeah, we'll we'll come back to that um, later. Very good question. Then I wanted to just give a bit more of an example of how we use Dataverse at Dance with our data stations and with Dataverse now. So we have, as I mentioned, no. Dance data stations. Um, I think I hear somebody else. I don't know if you have a question. Otherwise, please mute yourself. Um, thank you. So we have a done, uh, we have the dance data stations, and this is a data archiving service mainly for researchers. Although projects or institutes are also welcome to deposit their data, and this is making use of dataverse technology. As I mentioned, we're transitioning from our in-house system Easy, um, and in this case, Dance manages the technical infrastructure, so running the dataverse instance. And also manage, we also manage the curation of the data. So we check the metadata, we transfer files into sustainable formats and all of these kinds of um, things. Um, the data that is uh, uploaded is stored for long-term storage in our vault and the uh, dance data station is core trust seal certified. So we are in certified, certified trustworthy archive. Um, and if you want to know more, you can visit the, um, you can visit the data stations on our website. I should say that for now, we've only launched the Dataverse um, data station archaeology. The other ones are still running on Easy, and we're currently in the transition from our old system to the Dataverse installations. And this is an example of the, the data station, just to show you what it looks like. Most of you, I think, will be familiar with what Dataverse looks like, but this is, um, this is what you would see if you would go to our data station archaeology. And then briefly about Dataverse NL, just a little bit of repeating what I've said before. So Dataverse NL is a shared data archiving services that is provided by participating institutes and dance. So it also makes use of Dataverse technology. And in this case, um, as well as with the data stations, dance manages the technical infrastructure, but the institutes manage the creation and the depositing of the data. Um, Which so a that's, question. Um, yes. You just mentioned curation. There was a question. Curation refers to the validity of the data or GDR compliance or something else or what Yeah, is so it's a bit of a broader term. So um so it's a it's a bit of a broader term. It's uh, and it depends also probably who you ask. So in our case, what I mean by curation is that we when the data is deposited in Dataverse, that we check uh, whether it's well described whether indeed we check whether the metadata, the openly accessible information doesn't contain any personal data. Um, the GDPR compliance in our case um, 
So this this is also depends a bit on this, the terms of services that the archive has. In our case, the depositor is responsible for making sure that uh, any sort of legal requirements on how the data can be deposited are um, are complied with. So this is not something we do, but we do check the metadata. What I also mean by curation is that we transfer data into sustainable formats and we make sure that all the files are valid. So it's really about making basically sure that uh, what people submit is um, uh, is in such a state that we can actually archive it and that people will be able to reuse the data in the future. So it's, um, it's indeed the validity of the data, although we do not check the content. So we're really more on sort of, yeah, checking if it's described well, if the file's open and our archiving team has like a whole guidebook on what to do with that. And um, indeed, there are different levels of curation. So I think every archive also has a slightly different procedure. So there's not sort of one definition of what curation is. Uh, what you do have is that archives that are Quartra Steel certified have to comply with this certain set of standards. So they are they have to have a procedure on what they what they do, and there has to be some sort of a curation step for for a data archive to be certified. And this is also what makes the difference between the data station and data personnel, because in data personnel, DANS provides the technical infrastructure, but the institutes that run their own data first within it um, basically are responsible for the curation and the deposits. So they decide if something is, uh, is valid and if something is sort of um, good enough to be archived and stored in the dataverse. So thanks, this is a very good question. And again, I think there are lots of terms that people use uh, and they mean different things by it. So it's very good to clarify that. Um, yeah, so on data versus now, uh, I, I mentioned, so DANS manages the technical infrastructure, the institutes manage the creation and deposit. Um, the data is also stored in our, uh, in our vault. So that's similar to the data station. And um, it's possible to get Quartra Seal certification, but this needs to be applied for by the institutes because they are the ones who are doing the curation of the data sets. And within data personnel, um, there are 18 institutional data verses that you can find there at the moment. Um, so yeah, some of you I think are from data personnel, so maybe you can recognize yourself, but also if you're interested to learn more about this, you can go to dataverse.nl. Um, I have to say that I myself don't work with dataverse. We have a colleague, uh, Marion Wittenberg, who is, uh, who is um, the Dataverse NL manager at DANS. So if you have specific questions on this, then we might refer you to her later. All right, let's see. So this is uh, just a, a small screenshot of uh, Dataverse NL, how we have it here. So you can see that there's the Dataverse NL website, and then you can have the different data verses for the different universities or institutes below it, and then you can find the, uh, the institutional data there. And so uh, Dataverse as a software or Dataverse as a repository software basically helps to make data fair. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the FAIR principles, or at least the acronym. So FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's, uh, yeah, it has been introduced um, a couple of years ago as a way of sort of discussing on what, what data should look like and how we should basically handle research data in order to make sure that it can be reused and that it's of value so that something is not only stored, but it will also make sure that it's stored and described in such a way that it actually can be found and reused. So uh, what I wanted to do just briefly is go into the different principles and give some examples on how Dataverse supports the FAIR principles. So if we look at the, the findable uh, aspect of FAIR, um, Dataverse has persistent identifiers. So it supports persistent identifiers. You have to mint them yourself, uh, but it supports the, the use of persistent identifiers and it's even required. So you can have, for instance, a digital object identifier with your data set. But there also have been developments on adding other persistent identifiers to data sets. But this is supported by Dataverse. Um, Dataverse includes standardized metadata blocks for different domains. Um, so you can have uh, also customized fields, but there is a lot of metadata that you can put into Dataverse. 
and uh, you can customize metadata per collection. So that means that you can really decide on what type of information should be provided with a, a particular data set. And there are also some custom, there, there are some custom options, but there are also some general generic um, metadata blocks, for instance, for different domains. So this makes it uh, makes the data findable and also makes sure that um, yeah data can be described by the by the depositors and the researchers in a standardized way. Um, and also Dataverse has an option to create stem templates for easier metadata entry. So if people have data sets that are very similar, have similar uh, need similar descriptions, then they can create templates for that. And another way in which Dataverse helps uh, make data findable is that metadata can be exported in various formats. So that means that also machines can um, import metadata from Dataverse and make it findable through larger catalogs, for instance. And I'm just going to check the chat. Ah, OK, cool. Somebody shared, shared Marion's or asked for Marion and Kim shared the details. Great. Okay, um, yeah, so that's that's just a couple of examples on how um, Dataverse helps make data findable. If we, use, if we look at, at accessible, and some of the things will actually come back because they're important for both, uh, for multiple of the FAIR letters. Um, so the accessibility, again, data sets have a persistent identifier in Dataverse. That means through the DOI or another persistent identifier, data sets are always accessible. So if people cite the data, then people always get to the right uh, data set. Um, and what also helps with the accessibility is that there are different options in Dataverse to make uh, parts of data openly available or also restrict access. And also a new feature that I think has been introduced a couple of versions ago is that now the licenses are actually specified also, and it's possible to add machine actionable licenses to the data sets. Um, and for data sets, restrictions can be in it indicated on a file level. So that means that um, a depositor can really decide which data should be accessible and which ones should be restricted. For instance, if there's personal information or anything else in the data sets. And, um, and then also the, the conditions can be described. So that's important for the accessibility that people don't do not only know whether or not it's accessible, but also what the conditions are. And Dataverse has a um, is structured in such a way that this is possible to um, to provide. And what is important is that the met metadata is always openly accessible, even for restricted data sets. And the metadata, as I mentioned before, can also be exported and searched. So this also helps for the accessibility of the data sets stored in Dataverse. Um, then looking at the interoperability of, of uh, data. So um, as I mentioned already, Dataverse has some standardized metadata blocks for different domains. And if data is described in a standardized way, then that helps with the interoperability uh, of getting metadata, for instance, into a common catalog. Um, the metadata can be exported in various formats, which again helps by making metadata interoperable. So this is um, the interoperability here is mainly on the metadata level because on the data level this this is a bit more difficult. I think we are struggling with that in the fair movement at the moment, anyways. Um, another important aspect that has been added to Dataverse is that controlled vocabularies, so basically lists of terms, can be connected uh, to data to the metadata, which which then allows to have a standardized way of describing the data. And this is a feature that has been added recently and also was contributed uh, by Dan's and Sesta in the shock project. So this, um, this also increases the interoperability if we can use similar lists of terms to describe data. And we're also doing this with the Sesta archives. We have a couple of vocabularies to describe the topics, for instance, that we have. And we're all using the same terms and they're all translated in different languages. And that means that we can connect uh, the metadata much more easily than if we would all use um, well li lists that are not controlled and not standardized. And then lastly, the, uh, the reusable part of FAIR. So Dataverse also helps make data reusable uh, because again, you can make uh, data openly accessible or restricted. And with restricted, 
data sets dataverse allows for uh, um, for users to have data access requests so there's a manage a management of the the access to the data set um, and restrictions can be indicated per data file so you can you can make parts of data available and the other parts you can keep for uh, uh, either completely restricted or with an access request and dataverse supports various licenses uh, so the license support is something that also has been developed and what is, I think, a nice feature of Dataverse is that, that statistical files, so any sort of SPSS files or Stata files, are automatically transformed into tabular data files, which can be read by any sort of program. And this means that even if a researcher would publish an SPSS file, but somebody wants to reuse the data, doesn't have SPSS, they can still, um, uh, still use the data because it's transformed and can be read into another program. And there are many, many tools being developed also for reusability and for data visualizations, for instance. So there are a lot of options on making, making data more accessible, more reusable. So I have a few questions for you, Ricardo. Yes. So first is from Yoast, and I'm going to count this as very particular question, but could SNOMED as controlled vocabulary also be connected? Okay, I don't know SNOMED, so yeah. <laughs> Yoast would have to elaborate on this. I will um, give Yoast time to elaborate. The next yeah, so question. Yoast can elaborate. What I can say about mm -hmm. the, uh, the controlled vocabulary support, and that goes a little bit into too much detail maybe, but what at the moment um, has been done is that uh, Dataverse has been connected to SCOSMOS, and SCOSMOS is a vocabulary uh, publishing platform where many vocabularies are, are published. And that can be connected. So I don't know if SNOMED is published somewhere in sort of SCOS format. I don't, but I don't think that uh, um, it's important now for this session to know what SNOMED <laughs> is. But yeah. uh, Philip uh, has uh, replied in the chat. So thank you, uh, Philip, ah, perfect. Uh, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Philip is a colleague from, from Norway who also knows a lot of Dataverse, so I'm really happy that you can answer some of the questions uh, as well. But yeah, so if you want to know more, you can also contact us later about it. All right, next question uh, from Alia. What do you mean by metadata blocks? Are these prepared metadata for different domains? So this might have been on the interoperable side. So I will I will have a, a demo in a minute that will make okay. this a bit more clear. But basically, what it means is that if a researcher wants to uh, upload a data set, they will get an input form, and in this input form, they were there are different blocks where information needs to be provided. And um, a general block would be a citation metadata block where people have to provide a title, an author, um, uh, then abstract, and this these kind of things. And then there are other blocks where people provide um, uh, metadata that is specific to a particular domain. So for instance, in the social sciences and humanities, there would be information on the time method or the participation, like the participants and the sampling. So there are then uh, fields that participants can fill in that are related to that domain. But it will become clear in a minute, I think, when I show a little bit more. Uh, I have a, actually on the next slide, a closer look on in the Dataverse repository. So two more, two more things. First, Philip linked to two different resources about Dataverse supporting fair principles. So thank you for that, Philip. Yes, and I would prefer you. other people to check those. Those might be in our references as well, but click on them, have them now. And then a question from Shua. Looks like metadata standards are very important. What's the most common metadata standards that we should be familiar with? I think this is also potentially domain specific, but- Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think, indeed, this is a bit domain specific. So for the social sciences that CESTA operates in, but I know not all of you are in the social sciences, um, an important standard is DDI, is the Data Documentation Initiative. And that is a standard that is often used to describe social science data sets. And for instance, the metadata block on social sciences from Dataverse is also based on DDI. Um, then there are some general metadata standards um, like Dublin Core and Datacite that are basically about the sort of generic information, so the citation information. 
Um, and then for different uh, domains, there might be different standards. So there are there's some work on the, from the RDA that we could link you to that has an overview of metadata standards for different domains. So that might be might be uh, relevant. Um, and I think the good the good thing about dataverse is that you can export it in different formats. So I think that that is something that is really important because in the end, um, as long as a particular standard maps with other standards, then I think we can work with it or the machines can work with it very well, I think. But maybe we can come back to this as well. Yeah. Um, I see two other questions. The one I say is that I would say for Yoast is that there are several licenses, different types of licenses supported by Dataverse. And certainly I would say Creative Commons is one of them as well as Apache and yeah, so IT. yeah. What you can do in Dataverse now, and it's also a feature that Dan has been working on, is that it supports custom licenses. And in this sense, what that means is that as a as if you have your own Dataverse installation, you can basically say which licenses it should support. And in the case of Dance, we have added uh, uh, all of the Creative Commons licenses, I believe, and we have some custom licenses that are also added. And I think for Dataverse now, these are the same, but I'm not sure. Um, and if there are other archives here that have uh, can give an idea of the licenses they support, then I think that would also be good. But it's it's in a way a bit similar to um, to supporting the uh, the control vocabularies that Dataverse Dataverse doesn't say this is the license you have to use. It used to be that it's either CC zero or custom, but now you can load in, uh, for instance, the Creative Commons licenses. So in principle, I think Apache is also possible. And it's really something the archive determines. So this is not something the technology determines, but it's something you determine as the repository. Yeah. Um, Maybe I could add just a small note on this. Yeah. In, in Dataris, I know we're just tomorrow discussing what kind of other li standard licenses we want to include in Dataris, I know. Ah, great. That's great. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's kind of, if I mean, you want to, I mean, we want to uh, support more than CC0, but on the other hand, we don't want to have a list uh, of, of 100 licenses and yeah. we need some criteria on which yeah. licenses we, we um, recommend apart, yeah. apart from CC0. Yeah. yeah, so at Dance, I know we have, we have quite a list of C uh, Creative Commons licenses, but we do recommend people to use CC BY mostly, really. Um, but again, it's also up to the depositor. So I think this really depends on your own archives policy. Like, what licenses do you want to support? Uh, we can have a um, we can have a bit of a discussion about it later. I think. Um, and I see Simon shared the metadata standards directory of the RDA. Thank you, Simon. Yeah. It's great that we're <laughs> helping each other out here. Uh, Simon is a colleague from Dance. <laughs> yeah, Simon is also a colleague from Dance. Um, I see the question by uh, Alia, which says, is it possible to customize metadata elements? Yes, it's possible. You can create custom metadata blocks where you can put in anything you want. So that's possible. Yeah. I think um, you'll show us more now in the demo. So. Yeah, yeah, we will show a little bit more. Yeah. And um, it's great that there are so many questions, but I realize we're, we're running a bit out of time. So I will, I will continue with my slides, but please keep asking your questions because I think it's, it's very relevant and it would be great if we can answer as many of those as possible. Um, so yeah, I was talking about how Dataverse um, helps make data fair. And just uh, to elaborate and which will also, I think, make or clarify a little bit what we've, what people have been asking. So this is a closer look into a Dataverse repository. As example, I took the Dance Data Station Archaeology, which is the first data station that we've launched using Dataverse. And if you would go to the basic website of Dance Archaeology, you can see um, on top, you can see Dataverse's data sets and files. And Dataverse in this case, or in any case, basically a Dataverse is, is sort of a folder within within another folder. So you can have a Dataverse uh, installation and within it, you can have different Dataverses. For instance, what we have in Dataverse now with different organizations having their own Dataverse. In our case, everything is in one folder or one Dataverse. So we have zero other Dataverses. Um, and then what you can see is all the data sets. And these are basically the, the data sets that a researcher would update. These are the things that receive a DOI that people would cite. And then under this, you have all the different files. So a data set can contain multiple files. 
And in our case, uh, the files are not directly selected, but you could do that. So that's an, a thing of the interface. And then uh, underneath there, you can see the facets that you can use to filter. This is also something that you can customize uh, to some extent, at least. In our case, you can filter on the publication year, but also on a, one of the controlled vocabularies that we have been using, which is the RBR. It's a controlled vocabulary for, for the archaeology. Um, but this is also something people can do however they want, and your, your database might look different than this. Um, and then you have the search buttons and some metrics about the downloads. And in the search buttons, you can then search through the interface. If you are not so familiar with Dataverse, maybe I would recommend use the lunch to just go to either our data station or something else and just have a look uh, because we won't have that much time to go into, into too much detail here. Um, then if you would go into a data set, so basically you would search something and you would find a data set. This is what you can get to. So this is, this is also what the DOI of a data set would bring you to, which is basically the the um, page of the data set. There you can find some citation information, which includes the DOI, also, um, well, just generally the author, the name, the date, um, that. You can also have, uh, you also have some information about how often the data set is accessed. So something uh, on uh, downloads and access metrics. And then uh, if you would go down a little bit, you would see these different tabs. And one of them is the files, the first one. And the second one that's shown here is the metadata. And this is also what I mean by the metadata blocks that I was talking about. So here you can see that um, the first metadata block is called citation metadata. And that basically contains the general information. So it contains information about the date, the title, the authors, descriptions so an abstract, and sort of all this general information. And this is one of the blocks that we have. And I think, I think I also have a picture of the other ones. Yeah. So um, here you can see basically still the general information being shown. And then underneath, you can see the different other blocks that we have in our data station. Um, so we have a block on rights metadata that will give some more information about the, the rights of the data and um, sort of the, the rights holder. Uh, we have some relational metadata, which will include information on related publications, other data sets. And then you can also see the archaeology specific metadata. So this is this domain specific block that I was mentioning. And some of these blocks that we have are, uh, are native to Dataverse. So the citation uh, block is something that I think all data sets should have. But the other blocks were defined by us ourselves at DUNS. So this is something that we have determined based on our old system, the information we wanted and needed. So there's a lot of customization possible there. Um, but more and more Dataverse is also offering sort of out of the box fields and blocks that people are using based on common international standards. But yeah, if you were interested in the blocks, you can have a look uh, what, what we did. Um, and for your own system, this might be a bit different. Uh, oh yeah, and then here uh, I have another image of the archaeology specific metadata. So this is this domain specific metadata. And in this case, it links to some of the vocabularies. So that's what I mentioned before, that it's possible to link vocabularies. And in our case, we use uh, the ABR vocabulary. And um, you can see that the, there are links. So basically, they will go to the published vocabulary wherever that is. Um, and I think I have another one. Then uh, if you click on, if you have next to the metadata, you have the, uh, the terms. And this uh, gives information about the license. So in our case, you can see that there is a CC BY 4.0 license. And this is, again, also a clickable link. So it really links to the license uh, published on Creative Commons. And there, you can also specify the terms. So if the, if the data set was restricted access, a depositor could determine the terms, for instance. Um, but again, this is really also specific to your own archive and the policies you have on which licenses you want to support and which uh, restrictions or which access conditions you want to have. Um, so it's not something that Dataverse says you need to do in a certain way, but it offers um, a section where you can specify the terms. Um, yeah, so we talked about this in a way already, the Dataverse can be set up in various ways. So you have the Dataverse structure, so you can determine whether you want to have sub-Dataverses for different collections or not. And 
every sub dataverse can also have different permissions for different users and different people. So this is something you can determine yourself on what would what fits best with your own archive. And the metadata blocks and the required fields, you can also um, customize. So you can not only determine which meta metadata blocks you're using, but also which ones are uh, required, which is of course also important because if you make them optional, maybe people don't fill them in. Um, there are some that are required by Dataverse, uh, like a persistent identifier and some others. Um, but other than that, you can determine that yourself, like what you want to make required for a depositor. There's the control vocabulary support, which I mentioned. So you can say if, if a vocabulary is published, you can use it in your Dataverse. Um, and the rules and permissions, so who can create a new Dataverse, who can publish it, that can also all be customized. Um, there was a workshop given by some colleagues from us, from SESTA, on how to set up and configure a Dataverse repository. And there um, you can find the slides in, in this DOI. So if you're interested, then I, I would recommend you have a look there. And there's also a Dataverse manual for local admins, which I think is only available in Dutch at the moment. But for those of you from the Netherlands, uh, you can have a look there as well if you're uh, specifically interested in your own Dataverse Now repository, there's a manual that can, can tell you more about the different roles and permissions and basically more the technical details. Um, then I want to say that Dataverse is supported by a large community. So we have this global Dataverse community consortium, which provides a sort of collaborative space for people to work together on common problems. And we've also been working on, um, uh, on a SESTA Dataverse consortium where we work together with the SESTA archives that are involved in Dataverse, because there are some things that are specific to the social sciences and specific to um, also European archives that we would like to tackle. Uh, so if we look at the GDCC website, we see that uh, 32 organizations are involved and they have Dataverse community meetings, uh, I think yearly. Um, there's also an active uh, discussion group. This is um, a, a Google group and also a discussion group uh, you can access through this uh, GDCC website. Yeah, and as I mentioned, we also are trying to work on a community within, within uh, SESTA. Uh, there was a project that was related to the social sciences and humanities open cloud. Um, a part of the, the European Open Science Cloud that was developed. And in this project, we also worked on Dataverse with a couple of archives. And for instance, one of the things they created was this uh, control vocabulary support. So there's a lot of active development in the community. And if we get feedback from people on features that they would like, then we can try and sort of work on this together. And I think that's a very nice thing about open source software and something that is so actively supported in the community. That's what I wanted to say about- uh, There are two questions. Yes. And and don't worry everyone about the schedule. Ricard and I have made it so that, yeah, technically we're over from the next session, but it's fine. So from, I'm, I'm gonna say Gilad. <laughs> Do you measure data sets by quality of metadata? Mm, I'm not sure what is meant by this, actually. Okay, well, we can give them time to clarify. Yeah, so maybe you so want to... Next from Philip, I saw you have a metadata block for rights metadata. What kind of information do you add there? For example, information about reused sources as required by CC by licensed materials, question mark, or something else? So I think the best way maybe for you, Philip, is just to have a look at our archaeology data station, because then you can see what information is added there. Um, because I myself, I, I wasn't involved in setting up the archaeology data station, so I cannot say so much about this particular field and why we, why we what we have been adding yeah. there. So for now, I think because it's also a very specific question, I would just ask you to look at the website and we can come back to that later, maybe. Perfect. All right. Next. Uh, so Philip mentions that the GDCC Harvard runs community calls on Zooms every second week. The next one is at 5 p.m. today. So oh great. So if people still have yeah. energy after this, then you can you can join there. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And that's about it for questions in the chat. Did anyone else have any questions for Ricardo for this first part about Dataverse or any questions in general? 
because yes. otherwise we will take the short break. We're just yeah, going to the next session. So I'm going to launch a poll and you can all take five minutes, break, do whatever you want, answer the poll. If you can't see the poll, I will just say that it's asking, what is your domain or background? Because uh, Yost asked earlier in the chat and I was like, oh, that's a good question. Um, you can have multiple choice. And if you cannot see the chat, you, or sorry, if you cannot see the poll, because it depends on how old your Zoom is, you can just throw your domain into the chat. So with that, we will be back at 1138 for more content. I mean, Ricardo and I will just be sitting here, but we won't continue until 1138. So please go ahead and take a break. Yeah, let's have five minute break. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. All right, we have one minute left, but just to give the, the poll results, so 65% social sciences background, and then 31% life sciences and health. So that's really interesting. And then there's two other, and um, I'll fish, I'll fish for it. What is the other? I want to know. <laughs> I tried to give as many options as possible, but I'm a bit biased. <laughs> so otherwise, with that, I will say end poll. Maybe, Ricarda, could you take a screenshot? or I can try. I don't see it yet. Oh, people voting. <laughs> like, hold on, let me turn this aside. One archaeology. Excellent. Oh, nice. Good. <laughs> All right, I'll end the poll. Okay, I can hear the results. There you go. I made a screenshot for you, so that's great. So um, it's interesting because SESTA is, um, as I said, uh, the Consortium for Social Science Data Archive, so we promoted it there. But it's nice to see that also other people are, um, are joining us. And I should say that the materials that we will present in a minute, they have been developed by SESTA, but they can be used really also more widely. And of course, the Dataverse uh, materials are very much domain general. Um, although Dataverse has also been developed by an institute working with social science data. So there is a little bit of bias there. Um, and we're really curious to hear also if there are sort of things that maybe happen in other domains that we haven't covered, because I think that will be useful for us as well. So we will continue with the program. We will likely run a little bit over time into our lunch break, but we calculated an hour of lunch. So I think we will still have enough time. Uh, if you need to leave early, just let us know in the chat. And as we mentioned, everything has been or will be recorded. So if you miss anything, you can always watch it back later. So um, what I wanted to do next after this sort of brief introduction for Dataverse is uh, to show you example materials and outlines that you can use for your own training. Um, and these materials also, again, contain a lot of content. So if you're interested to learn more, these materials might be useful for you anyways. Um, I will try to go through it relatively quickly. And then after lunch, you will have um, the breakout session to look into it more and also select the things that are interesting for you particularly. So this is um, the first session <laughs> that we have on example outlines and materials, as I said. So the question that we wanted to answer in this workshop is how can you train people to use Dataverse? Uh, what is needed and what are things and materials that you can reuse that are already existing? Um, as I mentioned already, we have this Zenodo link where you can find many of the materials. And there's also a document with links that sort of links to extra materials that are also mentioned in the presentation. So you have them all in one place. Um, so what I want to go into in terms of sources of existing training materials is on the one hand existing materials from Dataverse. And I'm just going to check the chat. Oh, Kim shared the Zeno link again. Thanks, Kim. Um, so I want to go into existing materials that you can use from Dataverse, like guides and slides and videos and workshops. And then I want to get into existing materials that you can use from SESTA. And these uh, are mainly from the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide, but also we have some trainer trainer materials and we have a resource directory that has even more materials. And there also have been some workshops already that you might be interested in reusing. 
So first, in terms of the Dataverse materials, and again, in the Zenodo folder, everything is there. So all of the links you will find there as well, and the, this presentation too. So um, you can just look at the presentation and then get the links. Um, so the Dataverse materials, what we did is we created an overview of all the relevant materials, or not all, but the, some of the relevant materials that we think you can use. Um, and these are stored in a file that's called August 22 collection Dataverse materials for training. So this is um, an overview that should be in the in the Zenodo folder. Um, and it has the Dataverse website. So one of the things that we have is the Dataverse website, um, the Dataverse guide. So that's a user guide that I think Simon has shared earlier as well. There's also something called Dataverse TV, which has a lot of video materials that are interesting on Dataverse. And we also did a little bit of a Zenodo search. So what we did is we collected these materials and we uh, also um, put them into the SESTA resource directory. I will come and back um, to that in a minute. So that's also a link where you can basically directly find all of this overview. And there we have, um, so in this document, we have a collection of all of, of different things that you might want to reuse, like handouts, um, a menu, manuals, guides, other things that might be useful for you. Um, then one thing that has been developed by our colleague Simon, who is also here today, uh, was um, the Dataverse end user manual that has been developed within the Shock project. And it's basically a document that um, takes an end user, so a researcher, through the whole Dataverse process. And it describes everything around uh, setting up an account, uh, searching and finding data, reusing data, depositing data, and managing data submissions. And um, this, uh, this particular report is available at the, also on Zenodo with this link. And you can, you can find it there. And it's one of the materials that also will come back in the workshop slides that I will present later. So I think this is a very uh, useful handbook for anyone who wants to give training on Dataverse because it has a lot of information for researchers that you can, you can reuse. Um, then I wanted to mention the SESTA resource directory. And that one actually has uh, a list of Dataverse trainings, which is the same as the document that I mentioned before. So we, may, we wanted to have all of the Dataverse training materials that we found relevant also in a searchable environment. So we added them to the SESTA resource directory. And that one is on Zotero. And if you go to the link, Again, all the links are in the document called links, so you can find them there. And you can go to the Zenodo group of SESTA and the resource directory. And then there's a little tag that will give you the Dataverse training materials. So there is a lot of uh, information there of existing things that you might want to reuse. I can imagine that this will be, is, it's a lot of information, but I think it will become a bit clearer once we go through the example workshops, because that really tells you, if you want to do this, this is the material that you want to reuse. Um, so yeah, so the SESTA resource directory is a good way of, of starting with Dataverse materials, and then the manual that is available on Zenodo. Then in terms of materials from SESTA, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide, but it's a resource that was developed by SESTA, which is a guide on... Uh... Okay, we will uh, share the link to the manual in the chat in a minute. Yeah, Kim did that. Thank you, Kim. Great. So the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide is a guide on research data management. And it's, it was developed for early career researchers, particularly in the social sciences, but a lot of the information also is valuable for other domains because a lot of the things in data management and research data management are similar or have some sort of overlap. And it provides useful information on research data management in one central place. We created it with a team uh, in SESTA uh, starting in 2017, but we've been updating it regularly and it's free to use. Everything on there has a CC by SA license and it's available at sesta.eu slash DMEG. 
And what I will, what I've done is that I've selected some of the materials from SESTA that you can use to start sort of a workshop. Because if you would give a workshop on Dataverse, you don't only want to talk about the technology, you also want to talk about why we are actually archiving data and what it is that you are looking for if you find data for reuse, but also for instance, information, general information on metadata and licenses. And the DMAC can give you a lot of that information and has a lot of nice visualizations and nice materials that you can reuse. So just briefly about the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide. Um, so it follows, follows the research data life cycle, which you can see here. So it has um, a chapter for each of these phases in the life cycle, uh, which goes from planning research to organizing and documenting, processing, storage, protection. So that's about ethical regulations and GDPR, publishing and also discovery of data. And for all of those, there's it's an online resource where a lot of information has been stored. Uh, and a lot of information is given to help researchers sort of plan their own research. Um, it has a couple of recurring elements, such as expert tips, um, also a section on European diversity, where it describes differences between different European SESTA archives. It has information on qualitative and quantitative data. And we have a section where researchers can adapt their data management plan. So the idea was that people can read it and then already sort of write things into their own data management plan for their own project. Um, but the DMAC is not only a resource for uh, students or researchers, but also for trainers. So we developed a train the trainer package, which is free to use at sesta.eu slash TTTT. And if you go to this website, you will see that it will say that it is an old website. I think they are removing things at the moment somewhere else, but still a lot of information and materials are on there that might be useful for you in developing your own training. Um, so the, the, train, the trainer has workshop outlines and presentations, but also exercises for different topics. And we have quite a lot of documents such as handouts, workshop evaluation forums, and also the images from the DMAC uh, can be found there. And I think they're really nice. So they're the images that I also use in this presentation. And I think that can be really nice just to visually enhance your, your training. Um, yeah, so I think this is what I wanted to say in terms of what we have from SESTA and Dataverse. The thing I wanna do next is basically show you two workshop outlines that we've prepared that use these materials. But I just want to check if anybody has a question at the moment. I think there were mainly questions about data was in this part is much clearer, which is nice. Indeed. OK, great. So um, as I said, it's quite a lot of information. But in the afternoon after lunch session, we will go into breakout groups. And then you can really explore the materials a bit more for yourself. Um, but to make this a bit, a bit more concrete, what we thought would be nice to provide you with is two workshop outlines that give an idea of what a particular workshop could look like. And we wanted to have two, um, two workshops, one where you have a Dataverse training that focuses on Dataverse, uh, using Dataverse to find and reuse data. So really more from the perspective of I'm a researcher and I'm looking for data that I can reuse. And the second, that should say second, <laughs> the second training is focused on using Dataverse to archive and deposit data. So I think that's also why we asked before, like which training would you give? I think a lot of people are interested in this archiving part, but it might be nice to just consider both. So we have both of these workshop outlines available also in the Zenodo folder. And um, I will just go through them now. So you have an idea of what this is providing you. So the workshop outline for one is finding data and both workshops are described in, in a brief sort of um, structure to give an idea of what kind of context we chose for. And um, after lunch, you can think about this for yourself. So you can think about what level do I want? In this case, the workshops we propose are beginner level. But if you want to have something more advanced, then you can select other materials that we hopefully also have in the overview. Um, the time frame of this workshop was half a day, so a little bit 
a little bit like we ha what we have today. Um, the target groups usually for us are all early career researchers or PhD candidates. And um, we also have an indication of how many participants you would want for such a workshop, which is usually between 15 and 30 to make it enough um, interactive. So for this, for this workshop one uh, on finding data, the learning goals that you could think of could be that participants will know arguments for why using data is a good idea, and that participants will have a basic understanding of what Dataverse is, and that participants will be able to search relevant data, data sets in Dataverse. So that could, be, that could be a learning goal for a workshop on finding, uh, finding data. And here is then an outline program. So um, yeah, a little bit like, uh, like also what we're using today. So you would start with a welcome, then you would have a presentation on discovering data, discussion session, break, another presentation on a Dataverse introduction, and then an interactive session where people can find data for themselves. And um, which might be interesting because we had a bit of a discussion on licenses. I added a sort of little add-on session that is optional that you could do to deep dive deeper into licenses. And in, in the materials we provided, you can find um, a, a description of this workshop and also slides, example slides for all of these different presentations that you could reuse. Um, but I will go through them now to give you an idea of what this would cover. So if we look at the um, detailed program uh, and you would then sort of focus on discovering data for reuse, so what you would do in a sort of first introduction is you would go into the background of data discovery and reuse, and this could build on the data discovery chapter of the DMAC. So that's the, the SESTA resource that I just presented you. And there's this example presentation in our materials that you could use as a basis for that. And this is something you can look at um, into in the session after lunch if you are interested. And then for the Dataverse introduction, the idea would be to give background on Dataverse and it can build on the Dataverse user guide. So that's the Zenodo link that Kim just posted in, this, in the chat. And there's also a presentation that you could reuse. And it's basically the presentation that I gave to you like just before. So it's a lot of the same slides um, that you could reuse and then tailor them, of course, to your own archive. And then there would be this interactive session on finding data where you can ask participants to use Dataverse to search data. You can give them a topic or uh, that they could search for, or you could let them choose yours themselves depending on your group. And there you can build on a Dataverse user guide. Uh, so the Dataverse user guide has really this explicit instructions on how a data can be searched. And that is uh, also in the presentation. So this is something you could do for such a workshop. And then if you're interested in going more into details about licenses, um, there would be this additional session where you could talk about licenses and reuse that could again build on information that is available in the DMAC. Um, and there's an example exercise from the train the trainer package of SESTA. And then we also have this example presentation uh, that you can use to talk about licenses. So that's, that's sort of this first workshop in, in a way, like what you could do if you wanted to focus on making use of Dataverse to discover data. And then the second workshop outline that we have for you is on depositing data. So on training researchers to use Dataverse to archive data. And um, the workshop outline, again, we have in, in the in documents, you can read more about it, but the idea of this workshop is again that it's a beginner workshop. It's a basic introduction to research data management. It would again be half a day, so three to three and a half hours, focusing on early career researchers and having again between 15 and 30 people. Um, the learning goals for this workshop, for a workshop on depositing data, could be that participants will know at least three reasons for why data archiving is important they would know advantages of a trustworthy digital repository, they would have a basic understanding of Dataverse, and they would be able to upload a data set in Dataverse. That could be what you would want to achieve with such a workshop. And um, a program could again look 
a little bit like this. So it's a bit similar to what we had in the first workshop. You would start with a presentation on archiving and publishing, then have time for discussion, a break, and then the second presentation would be a dataverse introduction. And then you would have an interactive session where people deposit their own data and you could stop, stop with the discussion. And again, as with the other workshop, you could add something more if you're interested to do a little bit more. And just to go into the materials that we have for this type of workshop is that um, we have uh, for this archiving and publishing data, that will be really a, a background, again, using the DMAC, the archiving and publishing chapter. And there's an example presentation um, in, the, in the folder that you could use for this. And then the Dataverse introduction is relatively similar to the other ones, data, the other Dataverse in, instruction, but then uh, focusing on more the, the depositing part, again, building on the Dataverse user guide. And there's an example presentation for this as well. And in, in an interactive session, you could um, let participants use Dataverse to deposit data. Uh, if you have, you could use a test environment or you could just deposit a data set together and take them through the process. Um, and again, the Dataverse user guide is very nice to build on because it has a lot of instructions already for participants. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about. These were just an introduction to the materials that we have available for you. Um, I'm curious to hear if there are any questions. I can understand that it's a lot of information, um, but I want to hear if people have questions and if you are able to get all the uh, all the files from Zenodo and have a little bit of an overview already. So opening the floor to questions. And you can also ask questions about what we will do in the session after lunch. If you're curious, uh, we'll explain it later as well, but questions. <laughs> Everyone's very quiet. <laughs> or you've just explained it so beautifully that there's no question. Yeah, or it's a bit too confusing. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Well, Ricarda, no questions. OK, if there are no questions. Um, caught up to time. Then we caught up to time. Yeah, I went through it a little bit fast. Um, I see something. So it says it was yeah. Well, thank you, Sergeya. <laughs> <laughs> that is nice. Oh, there's a question. Haha. Uh -huh. So Philip asks, in the data discovery workshop, do you also include discovery services like data site search and Google data set search? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm not sure what exactly I put in the slides, but if you have a look in the in the data management expert guide, it does also cover indeed the different search engines and the different ways of uh, how data can be found. So so yeah, I think in, in this case, we wanted to have something where, where people use the archives or, or the repositories search, um, I guess, because we wanted to focus on database. But it, the DMAC has information on this as well. Um, and I think we have been in the past also organizing some data discovery workshops from SESTA that were a bit broader. So they didn't focus on Dataverse. They were a bit broader. So I think these would also be interesting materials for people to reuse. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for the question. So I have one additional resource to share from SESTA. So uh, for, for this workshop, Ricard and I have mainly been using the DMEG because it's the flagship uh, guide. It's beautifully illustrated and it's well maintained. And SESTA is also working on um, another guide that will soon be beautifully illustrated and well arranged. And so I'll just share my screen right now. So, and that is, there's another guide, which is the data archiving guide or the DAF, as we call it in the Netherlands. And there will be a training event coming up on the DAF. So this is more aimed at new employees in data archives. So this might be more in the realm of if you're providing training to colleagues. And you could also incorporate some of the aspects of the DAF into it because there are chapters on ingest and pre-ingest and things like that. 
So this workshop is coming up in October and there will be a full day. You will see my face there again because I wrote one of the chapters. <laughs> Um, but just wanted to share that SESTA event coming up as well. And otherwise, yeah, Maria says a lot of information to process, but luckily we can read it at your own pace. Exactly. That's really what we were aiming for. So um, maybe I'm allowed to grab the microphone of course. Uh, over here. Um, yes. So finding uh, data always has two sides uh, to the coin attached to it. One is uh, the description of your own uh, data sets and uh, the other way is uh, the user uh, interacting with the user interface. So what I'm uh, curious about is uh, in the workshop, are both aspects covered? Um, so, um, I mean it's order, just also yeah. an example workshop. So if you want to want to cover something else, then that's obviously always possible. What this workshop was now focusing on is first giving an introduction about sort of data, searching for data. And also there, there is this little discussion session where people can think about like what data sets do I actually need? Um, I don't know if you mean that. And then the second part is more about using Dataverse to search, to search for data sets. Um, the data data management expert guide, the chapter on discovery has quite a lot of information also on how people can sort of redefine their search behavior or think about what it is they need um, or what it is they want to reuse. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but there's some information there for this. Okay, uh, I will be uh, surprised. Uh, this <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you can, yeah. You can have you. a look. Yeah, yeah, you should have a look yeah. at the materials and the idea. So the idea of the workshop outlines is really just to give you a starting point. And then if you think, oh, but it should be covering this or that more, you're really very welcome to uh, create your own. And that's also what we're going to do after lunch. The idea is we will have two breakout rooms, um, one chaired by me and one chaired by Kim, so that uh, people can work on creating their own outlines. And then you can have a look at the materials and also get a feeling of what is there and how you could tailor it to your own, um, yeah, to your own audience. Um, because it's really just a suggestion. It's not that we think this is what you have to do. It's just sort of, we came up with two ideas to make it a bit easier to find the materials and maybe also guide your search for materials for your own workshop. Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to share this. So we have now reached this part of the program, everyone's favorite part, the lunch break. So we will have it until 1 p.m. Central European Standard Time. Sorry, summertime. I'm not European. And then we'll go into the breakout session. So uh, this is your official lunch, plate, lunch break permission. I'm now going to pause the recording and I will do my best to remember to unpause it when we're back from lunch. Otherwise, Ricard and I will still be on the session, but we might not be in the room. If you have any questions, put it to the chat and we will pick it up just before we start the next uh, session. So we're gonna slowly come back into the final session of this workshop. Thanks to everyone who's able to stick around and everyone who had to leave. Maybe you're watching this on the YouTube later. Welcome back. So this final session uh, that I'll be leading is on planning and troubleshooting. And the first part of it, we will be going over the checklist that Ricard and I have prepared for you to adapt to your own needs. And the other half, we're gonna be playing a bit of a game. Uh, it's a train the trainer game on tr troubleshooting potential issues within a workshop or within a training. And we want you to bring in your own experiences as well. Or if you have a really particular question, feel free to bring it up right now and Ricard and I can give our own advice. As well as if you have your own advice for someone's question, please feel free to add to it as well. So with that, let's go into the final session. So planning and troubleshooting. My dad has this very annoying saying that he likes to say, which is that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. And I remember it every single time I have to give a workshop and I open up the checklist. So checklists take the stress out of planning as long as they are useful for you. So the takeaway from this training and this particular session is to have an event planning checklist that is useful for you. 
So we have combined three checklists into one document. So we took the SESTA event planning checklist, as well as the DOMS internal planning checklist, and some recommendations that the shock came up with into one. And so it's a, this, these checklists are particularly um, garnered to online offerings. So online trainings, webinars, stuff like this workshop. However, you can adapt it as necessary for in-person or hybrid training. And so we have it in two complementary forms. There is a table checklist or a narrative checklist. And so the easiest way to explain it is to just look at it. So within our materials, we can find this organization checklist. And we'll have to see, I have to reshare to the actual checklist. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's blow up this magnification a bit. Oh, not that much. Okay, so as we said, this is a this is an amalgamation of three other checklists, and I'm just going to scroll through because we're not going to go through it all the way. However, we do also want to recommend the Shock Online Train the Trainer Guide which came out of a Libra workshop in 2020. So the first part is a table. And now I have to change the magnification again because we made it landscape. And this breaks down the tasks of an event into different uh, responsibilities. Now, if you're a one person show, you're going to be the organizer, the facilitator and the communicator. But if you are working on a team, it can be useful to break up these roles according to someone's um, strengths or to someone's connections. So with this is from the SESTA checking list, there is an organizer, a facilitator, and a communicator. And these roles are explained here, but essentially one is going to basically oversee the checklist and make sure all the elements are falling into place. The facilitator is more technical, looking at physical bookings if necessary. And then the communicator is all things social media, email, website, etc. Within a smaller archive, you might have a separate communications team, and that's just someone who you send things to to put on the Twitter, or it could be someone has multiple hats and they end up taking on these roles. So the checklist itself is chronological, and it starts at eight weeks prior to the event. And then you see all these tasks here. Feel free to change this into an actual checklist. You can print it out. You can have one for each session that you're running. But most importantly, what Ricardo and I want to really drill in here is that this checklist should only contain things that are useful to you and the event that you're running. So the first time you have an event and you want to involve this checklist, whether it's the table or the narrative, really go through the elements be like, is this important to my organization? Is this actually applicable? So for instance, checking if the date is free in your organization's calendar and checking against holidays, that's kind of a no brainer <laughs> because you're like, you really don't want to provide a training on maybe the school vacation week. That's a common thing here in the Netherlands or we try not to provide training on that week because a lot of people will be taking time off. And then all these other elements. So as we go through the checklist, we get closer and closer to the date, five weeks prior, three weeks prior, and then you get to a different checklist on the day itself. And again, checklists are only useful if you actually look back at them. So checklists will have to be referred to again and again. Maybe you have to set a calendar reminder to look at the checklist, or you take the dates from here and you put a little calendar reminder for each item, or you use a travel board. It's really up to you. On the day of the event, this is all just related to hosting the event itself, kind of also we'll come back to troubleshooting, <laughs> keeping in mind things that might go wrong. And then after, a lot of people forget about the after the event. However, it can be very important for your organization when it comes to sharing information that you've put in, as well as uh, maybe tracking KPI or tracking uh, interaction with your designated community, things like that. So that was the table checklist. And then there's a narrative. And this is more useful for people 
or for organizations who want to know why they are organizing event and thinking of all of the elements that they need to hit with an event. So you are forced to think about, okay, well, there's a date and the time and the contact person, but what is the objective of the event? Who is my target audience? How am I going to get them involved? How am I going to get the invitation out to them? What advertising am I going to do? What speakers should I have in order to make it like appealing? Setting the agenda, very similar to the uh, timeline that Ricardo and I came up with for the program of today, that's essentially the same thing. And then technical, and this can be anything from whose Zoom are we going to use to who is going to talk to the ICT person about the internet for that day, depending on the little things about your building that you might have to keep in mind. <laughs> so, and then post event outputs, who is going to be responsible for writing up about the event? That's also important. How are we going to talk about what we provided? Who's going to check the transcript when it goes up on YouTube to make sure that it's accurate? All of those types of things. So that is what the narrative checklist provides. Now I have to switch my share again. <laughs> oh, I have too many documents open. It's impossible. All right, one sec. <laughs> Never ending screens, nearly there. All right. So, all right. So, the things to keep in mind about using checklists. First, like I've been saying, they should be suitable to your situation. Delete anything that is not applicable because it will just be confusing later if you need to delegate a checklist to a colleague or someone who is helping you out for that day or a volunteer from an organization, another organization. So having more than one person to help organize is very nice. I will tell you that directly because it will really take the stress off as well as people have different perspectives and different experiences. They might be like, oh, have we thought about X? And you're like, I've never even considered X. Yes, we should think about that. But definitely keep a single list because as soon as you have two people maintaining their own to-do lists, uh, things can become miscommunicated. Keep a single to-do list, even if it's just a Google Doc that you both have access to that you're keeping track of. And yeah, the list doesn't check itself. Assign tasks, set dates, follow up. So planning is great, but what about unexpected things? So that's where troubleshooting comes in. And here we're going to use Gwen Frank's Train the Trainer game 2.0. This is designed for Foster, which is which was a project related to open science. And it involves six elements to keep in mind. These are six changing elements that depend on the type of training you're giving, the situation, as well as some random trouble. So the things that you will know the most about are the audience type, maybe the audience mood, and the knowledge level coming in. And this is where you're like, oh, I never know the knowledge level before I give a training. It can be important to pull that when you're in the registration. So when we asked you, when we were registering you for this event, we asked what your experience with Dataverse was. And that was for us to know, okay, what's the knowledge level of the group coming into this training? So some things that are more concrete is audience size, because you can limit this. You can especially limit it as having a maximum. Now, like some people don't show up, life happens. Some people register twice by accident. That's okay, that's all within the flow of things. But you should be able to say, okay, I am only comfortable training this many people online and having breakout sessions if it's only two people. That's the maximum for our workshop, as well as the training type. And we'll go into what training type is. Trouble, you cannot control for that. <laughs> that is the one uncontrollable variable and we'll go into what that means. So, like I said, the things that are somewhat within your control. So you could have a one hour webinar. You could decide for a full day workshop. You could decide to do an asynchronous recording that you then share with your community. You know, the size, your type, maybe you're particularly going for researchers or fellow staff members or librarians. 
the things that are outside of your control are the knowledge level and their mood. So the mood will also be interesting. So they have skeptical, uninterested, <laughs> off-topic questions or the trouble. And so for our workshop today, today is a full day workshop. This is the image that's used from the, from the train the trainer game from Glenn Frank. So we are a full day workshop. We're a medium sized group and this orange is our target audience. So here I put librarian and other because they don't have data steward and they don't have a data steward does not fall within the pack, so other. And then the knowledge on Dataverse is advanced practitioners and no previous knowledge because we have some people coming in who've installed entire Dataverses within their organization and other people who are less familiar with it. So really the knowledge level of this training runs the gamut. But now I'm going to introduce a potential situation that maybe you were planning for. Maybe this is one of the plannings that you made in the last breakout. And so how about a one hour webinar for your designated communities? That would be researchers, citizen scientists, senior researchers who you're giving them a webinar on Dataverse, whether it's your installation or just Dataverse in general. They have no previous knowledge, or maybe they have some theoretical knowledge of data repositories and how to search for data. And the um, audience mood is unknown. You don't know because it's a webinar. Now I'm going to introduce the trouble. You have technical issues and there's no internet. <laughs> how do you deal with this? So I'd love I'd love to open the floor uh, either at the chat or if someone wants to turn it on and say I've totally done this this was what happened. But any solutions in the moment we'll go over preparing in advance I already have some suggestions there but does anyone know how they would deal with this in the moment. Well, if you're if you have a colleague helping you, you could ask him or her if they could just take over. <laughs> yeah, true. If they're sitting in another place, another office or other building. Yeah. Villa Mine suggests have a backup speaker, like a backup person to speak or a backup microphone, or both technically could work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this this has happened to me. This has happened to me giving a training. It was a uh, good old 2020. And my backup plan was I had uh, mobile data on my personal cell phone and I turned on a mobile hotspot and that is how I gave the training. Um, not my favorite method, but in that moment, it was the only solution I had. Now in the future, such as when I'm giving this training, I make sure I'm in a room that has a working ethernet cable, <laughs> which is my next suggestion. Just avoid Wi-Fi if at all possible. So if it's the technical issues is maybe the camera that I'm using now wouldn't work. I have a backup one in my laptop. If the conference cam isn't working, you could also just say, okay, everyone, I'm giving this webinar and unfortunately my camera isn't working, but my microphone is fine. Uh, if your microphone is not fine and you're giving a webinar, that's indeed when an extra colleague, <laughs> like just asking if someone has a working laptop. Uh, everyone say bye to Yoast. So the other option is, and never be afraid to cancel uh, an event if you really cannot put it on to the level that things would be understandable. And what I mean by that is sometimes you can't give a live webinar, but you say that you are recording it and then you will stream it with a Q&A afterwards. And this really helps for if you are giving webinars in a location where broadband internet is not guaranteed, and where you really want to make sure that your designated community gets access to the content at their own time. So um, a big example of this is if a country has rolling blackouts due to issues with an electrical grid or just poor internet quality, the best solution to that might be to record the webinar and allow them to stream it and then offer questions later. So, that, so that's one. Now the next one, so our first one was for designated community. Now you're giving a full day training workshop for staff. 
Maybe it's other data stewards that are working in your archive or volunteers that are helping you set up the dataverse, et cetera. You have, see, I got to fill in data steward and ICT steward here as the participants, as well as maybe project coordinators. And these red, we haven't seen yet. This is audience mood. This is, you have some shy people, you have some skeptical people. They built the old system. They don't know why you need a new system. You have a know-it-all who actually like, they're, they have their own installation and they use it for their personal stuff, who knows. And people who are asking questions and you don't know the answer. So that's a variable knowledge level. Here's the trouble. You have a distracted audience or a bad group dynamic. That's like when one person runs the show or you forgot something. What are the solutions to this kind of training? So I'll give you some hints from the planning. Oops. Uh -huh. So you can prepare for this in advance. I know it seems unlikely, but you can prepare for this in advance. Um, the idea that if you forget one thing in a training, it's a, it's a devastating failure is so not true. You are a human being too, and you're giving a training to your fellow people. You all work together in the same institute. They'll see you after the training. So you just have to remind them that like, oh, I'll have to follow up with you with that question. That really helps. Or you can kind of be a bit more like, we're all learning this at the same time. I'm just here to help you out. <laughs> Maria says, I have no solutions, but unfortunately I recognize a lot of the audience types you described. I know, um, I, I will swear by feeding people. I know this seems silly, but I think that if you provide a variety of food at a full day workshop, people will be nicer <laughs> because you are giving them something. The other thing I will say is like, just provide breaks because people will become very irritable if they are forced to do one thing. So if you just provide enough breaks in your training, maybe people can go check their phone during the break and they won't do it when you're in the middle of giving a presentation. You can also engage management and just be like, hey, this is a really important training. I'd love if you also came on as a speaker and then you can have one of your layers of management be talking about why you're making the change to this particular distribution or why this is an important training. Philip said, don't they say people behave more nicely after lunch? I guess it depends because in my experience, people are sleepy after lunch and they like nod off, but yeah. Otherwise you can make flashcards or notes to help you out. The main thing to remember is that, yeah, um, there's always gonna be something that goes wrong <laughs> and try not to sweat the small stuff, but there are ways that you can help yourself out, especially if you're new to providing a training, you're in a bit uncertain about it, practice makes perfect. So how about your experiences? Does anyone have any other experiences that I haven't covered here that they'd love to have advice for, or they recognize an element and they wanna dig in? And Ricardo, I'll ask you, how long is my session supposed to go? I already forget. Yeah, I should know that, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one question that I had from someone in my breakout room was related to this, and I just wanted to share it as well. And that's where maybe you're giving a training to a variable audience with different knowledge levels. Some are very, uh, very knowledgeable about whether it's a digital interface or fair data management in general, and the other are a bit new to it. How do you deal with not making it too complicated for the new people, but not making it boring for the well-versed people? And the structure that I try to stick to is if you have more than two hours or more than three hours, you actually break it up into two different sections of a workshop and you tell people there will be an introductory section to bring you up to speed, although you like phrase it nicer than that. And then there's a more advanced detailed workshop or session that people can sign up for separately. So you let them know the structure in advance so they know that, okay, the first half hour, the first hour is going to be an introduction to fair data principles, for example. And then the, the third half or the second half is going to be more detailed to how this relates to the dataverse distribution that we're working on. And then they can say like, okay, I'm going to join a bit later because I don't need to be there for the introduction. 
So that's one solution. Philip asks in hands-on sessions, how to make sure everyone is on the same page. So the obvious one is checking in with your audience often and asking them, you know, is everyone clear? Or if you have a question, come and ask me in particular. Otherwise, Ricardo, do you have any suggestions to make sure people are on the same page? Yeah, in hands -on. I think for hands-on sessions, I would probably try and have more people there to help so that, that you can maybe also, well, if it's online, you could have different breakout rooms depending on the, the knowledge of the people. And you could have, if you have multiple people, then there's also enough room to help. Um, but I think it also helps to really clearly state the sort of goals of the workshop so that people sign already know what they're signing up for. So if you expect a certain level, be really clear about it. And then uh, I think what helped us really, what Kim also mentioned, that we tried to ask some questions beforehand, like how much experience do you have? What do you expect? What are your questions? Because then you already get a feeling of, okay, maybe a lot of people will ask questions about this or that, and you can prepare for it. These, I think, my only, uh, my only, the only other one. It only works if you're from a bigger organization, and that's if you were providing a training and you invite your colleagues to join in, and then they one only it only if it should benefit them, not so that you can have like a a little mark in the crowd, but like <laughs> um, if they're joining in and it's beneficial, they're also interested in you providing a good training, and they can let you know if someone needs additional help or something like that. Um, so that's one method. From Maria, you talked about one person taking over the show. How do you deal with them? So it can happen in two ways. And it can happen with someone is very knowledgeable about what you are talking about, and they would like to contribute, but they're not doing it in the most constructive way. If you can benefit from foresight and know that they will do this, you can invite them to participate in the training with you. Or you basically have to be like, uh, okay, so how do I say this? Sometimes um, you do a method where you give them a compliment, but ask them to stop. So you say, you, you know so much about this and that's great. How about we open up the floor to other people who want to talk on the subject? Um, that's a very school teacher method <laughs> of that approach. And sometimes it doesn't work. Otherwise, there is a line between being disruptive and being um, just being a member of an audience. I don't think we're talking about someone who's being truly disrupt disruptive that you have to ask them to leave, but definitely um, if it's an in-person event, you can, and there's a microphone involved, you would just not give them the microphone as much. You would say, we wanna make sure the microphone gets all the way around the room before we return. And then if it's online, you just say like, I'll have to, like, I wanna to go to someone who I haven't heard from yet. And then we'll come back to your question if it's still necessary. It's, it sounds a bit silly, but those are some methods where you still try to allow them to be a part of the experience, but hear other people, because that's the main problem is they're taking up the time that other people could use. So any other experiences? Otherwise we can move on. Yeah, just to note, Kim, so we have until 14.35 for this mm -hmm. session. Um, it's going to end sooner than that. That's okay. And then, and then we have time for the wrap up. But just, just to check, I put up the program. <laughs> <laughs> so Brigitte asks, what if the dataverse freezes because too many people were uploading the data set? Have any experience about this? What is the possible solution? I don't have any experience with this. I also don't know. So what I would suggest, especially if you do a sort of a sort of dataverse test or like an, a dataverse archiving test, that you use a test instance, uh, if if you can in some ways. So I know for dataverse now we have it because you also don't necessarily want people to use your real archive and publish something in a training. So having a test instance would be good, and I think it would be nice to just then test it beforehand with, with a developer if you can and see how many um, how many people can actually use it at the same time. So, uh, but what what I usually do is I, if, if I want to demo something online is that I have backup slides with screenshots so that if the site doesn't work, I can at least show the screenshots. Um, and I mean, it doesn't really help if you want people to upload data themselves, but you could sort of, 
well go through it once and then sort of make screenshots or make a video recording of this just as a backup because I think it does happen often that sites are offline or something doesn't work so having having a backup would be good I think and Kim put the demo the database in I actually didn't know the link so that's good thank you it, it came up in our session and Philip also says maybe you could remind people not to upload too large files for testing. And I think it also really depends if what your goal is, because I think probably I would, if I wanted people to upload uh, data in the training, I would probably have a relatively small group so that you can really help them if they have any issues. So then maybe, yeah, they are not like 100 people at the same time uploading something. Mm -hmm. All right. So then we're wrapping up unless we want to talk about more things that have totally gone wrong. I guess um, this may or may not be in the checklist, and that's because it's a very, it, you, it wouldn't be in the checklist. However, for some events within DANCE, we do have what's called a go-no-go -no -go date. And that is a date that we decide in advance of a very um forward facing event where there would be a lot of desired publicity or something like that and the go no go is basically there to be like okay by this date we should know that we can reliably put on the training the workshop the session on the day it is scheduled or is there a problem has someone dropped the ball which is not always their fault we're very busy people you know or has something changed within the landscape that we need to address? For instance, if you were giving a training on Dataverse and suddenly your Dataverse installation was not working properly because something had to be fixed on the back end, you would probably be like, okay, this has happened before our no-go date. We should decide, do we wanna move the training? So that would be an example of it. And by keeping that in mind during your checklist or during your planning, you can avoid a lot of issues where if you're like, oh, we've picked the date and it's in the calendar, so we have to do it. And then you're like, well, there were actually a huge bunch of issues that happened. Uh, sometimes it's foreseeable and moving a date's not the worst thing ever. But yeah. I can't think I, I'm not I'm all out of workshop horror stories that I could. Uh... Yeah, maybe one thing that I noticed, especially with online workshops, is that it's a bit hard to predict how many participants will show up. Uh, I have experiences where we had, I think, 75 people register and 15 people show up on the day. So I think especially for online workshops, it's good to keep that in mind because your workshop obviously will change a little bit depending on how many people are there. So being prepared that, especially in online workshops, less people will show up and also sort of being prepared to then make it more interactive or have less breakout rooms or more breakout rooms, um, I think is very useful. Um, and I've heard more people that have that experience. Mm -hmm. With live events, I think it's a little bit less the case. Um, although in particular, if we provide free events, people tend to not show up on the last minute. Um, it's always good to remind people and ask them then to, to tell you that they're not coming, especially if you have a live event and you've ordered lunch, uh, because that can be very frustrating. Uh, but I think in COVID times, a lot of people sign up for webinars and or for trainings and then they don't show up. Um, we have tried to, uh, if you have a training that has a lot of interaction and where you really, for instance, you have like limited space, so you really want the people to show up because otherwise you have to... Um, you have to tell other people that they cannot join uh, is that if you make the sign up form a little bit more complicated and basically not only like let them sign up with an email and a name, but also ask them some more information and ask them to provide maybe even like an email from hey I want to I want to join that then lowers the bar a bit. And then um, you have a chance that people who sign up are really interested and will not just watch the recording, so I think that's maybe a tip from our side. But even then, I've had the experience where we had quite a lot of people sign up for a workshop that did require them to be a bit more elaborate in their sign up form and still not that many showed up. So it's just something I think we have to deal with as well. Mm. So two things. First, Philip mentions another thing we always do before hands-on sessions. And this is also a great tip that you might not think of. 
ask our technical staff not to work on our test instance of Dataverse on the day of the workshop. And that, like, it may seem obvious, but also depending on how your organization is structured, you might not have a lot of contact with the tech side when it comes to planning your workshop. So really, it is important that maybe someone who's doing the organizing role or the facilitating role or whatever part you decide to do is like, ah, and I'm going to let ICT know that we are giving a training that day, please don't touch it. <laughs> so yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and then Philip says, another challenge, how to avoid people leaving when we start breakout sessions. So I'm assuming this is particularly for online because in person you like make eye contact with them and they would actually have to leave a seat in the room. But uh, for digital online distributions, yeah, it, it does happen. And I think the main thing that I find is helpful is to be very upfront about what they are for and how long they will last. Because as soon as someone is like, oh, breakout, I don't know how long this is going to be or what it's going to do, and they just tap out. I think also respecting that um, everyone has stuff to do with their time. And maybe some people really dislike the idea of talking in a breakout room. I have been asked in advance from people when I give a training and I say there's a breakout session and they ask me, will I be expected to talk? And I always say no, because there's no way I can expect all of them to say something and I'm not a teacher. So they're not getting graded on participation. And that really lowers the barrier to entry for a lot of people who are like, I am fine doing a breakout, but I wanna have my camera off and I don't wanna talk, fine. Um, as long as you yourself are fine filling that gap, it can work out. Ricarda, anything from your end? Yeah. And also anyone else who has experience, feel free to Yeah, check. please. Uh, others can also add. So what I want to add to that is that um, maybe not breakout sessions, but in live meetings, I also often notice that people leave before the end of the last session because they, you know, they want to get home on time or whatever. So it's it's like common even in, in sort of live events. And I think for both, what what helps are two things one is make making sure that it's not too long so that really sort of thinking about okay how much attention do people actually have and how much time do we have and how do we build in breaks so that people don't feel like oh i'm really too exhausted to do this now that's one thing and i think what kim says also helps in making making it clear what what uh, what is expected but what also helps in the program is to have at the end something interesting, like if you, for instance, doing a live event, you can have a very interesting keynote speaker at the end and rather than having it earlier so that people really stay because they're like, oh, I really want to see this or hear this. So if you can anticipate that some speakers will be very interesting, it's sometimes smart to have them relatively late in the program so that people stay for that. Mm -hmm. um, on Online, of course, people can come hop, hop out and hop back in. Um, but I also feel like if people are not interested, then, well, yeah, then they, they should just not join. Apparently then um, the session wasn't interesting for them. Uh, I think I would always hope that people then provide feedback to us. And they, they don't always do, but it would be really nice. Um, and I think so it's, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's always uh, uh something we can do that provide like prevent people from leaving yeah but i think these are things that you could consider yeah making it a bit easier i'd say the finally i know some people will be like well we won't record because everyone should be there and you by by recording something and not recording a breakout like we did because we know it's awkward to see recorded breakouts I would say that the idea of swapping out recording so that people have to attend in person doesn't suit people who literally can't be there and would like the information after. So you're you're cutting people out who potentially wouldn't even be there in the first place with that decision. And I think you're just better, you're also conserving your effort if you're making a recording because then you can refer people to a recording and not have to give another two hour explanation. So that's a benefit. Yeah. Philip, Philip, oh, well, I, I just wanted to uh, say Philip has another challenge about getting consent for recordings and how it works with GDPR. I think this is also something we were struggling with a bit, and I think I'm not sure if somebody has the perfect answer. Usually what's, what I do in workshops is that at the beginning, you mention it will be recorded and you tell people that they can turn off the video. Um, and what we did now is that we explicitly did not want to record the breakout sessions where people might 
you know, share personal things or experiences. That's what we're going for now. I have also in the past sort of blacked out all the videos if I did, wasn't sure if people re really consented for that. So generally trying to have as little information about participants on there as possible. Um, but I'm not sure what the lawyers would say about getting consent <laughs> for GDPR. I'm not sure, Kim, if you have experience. No, because I usually put it in either the registration form or I put it in the email that includes the link to the workshop. And then I say it will be recorded. And then that's a that's a active decision. It's not, I try not to wait until the event actually starts to say, oh, by the way, we're recording. And if anyone has an issue with it, like at that point, it's like, it's too late. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that it's somewhat an issue. And, and that might change how... Um, because for now we said we're recording gallery view. This is this is backstage nonsense for anyone working with Zoom. Right now we said we're recording gallery view. I'm actually recording all the views and I might decide to only do active screen view. And then that way it's only Ricardo and I's camera that would actually be in the recording. I have to work it out with Zoom. Yeah. So yeah, if others have experiences I want to share, I think feel free. We all have the same issues to deal with. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and all right otherwise we can go to the wrap up so ricardo you're in charge of wrapping where am i and what i don't know we can both do it well we want yeah, to okay no 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 to give people a bit of a time to tell us what you achieved today um yeah, we are really curious to hear if this was useful for you and what we could do better. In a moment, we also have a small survey that we would really appreciate if people fill in. But yeah, if somebody wants to just give us a bit of feedback of what you achieved today, that would be really great. I'm gonna stop the screen share because it's just tell us what you achieved today. Hi, so... Um... I just want to say thank you for organizing this. I think it was very useful, very practical. Um, and I'm definitely going to make this training. Um, if I had any um, like extra feedback to give, it would be maybe make the first breakout or make the breakout a little bit longer because I was really enthusiastic to start working and then we had to discuss again. So that was the only um, frustrating part, I guess. Okay, thanks. That's nice to hear that you found it useful and also that you started working. So that's uh, very nice. I also wonder if people still have questions about Dataverse, because I know during the first session, we had a lot of questions about sort of Dataverse background. Are there still some questions left now that we could either answer now or that people um, have that we maybe want to take to uh, colleagues and answer later? I have a question if no one wants to go first. Yeah, you can. Okay, so with the introduction of the new licenses, um, we're coming across some problems because I work with psychology and pedagogy, so it's very sensitive data. And it's almost always put on restricted, so they have to email for access. Um, so we would like some form of CC by where attribution is given, but the data is destroyed afterwards. Mm, okay. Um, and we don't have that option, I think. We can just put custom everywhere, I guess, but. Yeah, I so that's... I think in, in principle, indeed, this would be a custom license because it cannot be a CC license because you have to actually request access. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also something we are working on at Dan. So basically what we need much more is more licenses for restricted access where specific conditions apply. So for okay. instance, um, you would indeed, you would want to ask people to, uh, to give credit. You would want to ask people to, um, sometimes somebody has to be from a university to use the data. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the data has to be destroyed indeed, which is for an archive an issue. I think we, we don't destroy any data. So for dance, that would not be, you, could, you cannot store that with us. Uh, but I think these sort of, there are a set of standard criteria that many people would reuse. And the nice thing about the CC licenses is that they are so generic and that they reuse the different components. 
And having something like that for restricted data access uh, data sets would be really great. It's something we're working on uh, at Dance, but as far as I know, it doesn't exist in this form. So it is, I think at the moment you would always have a custom license. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just, that, that is. Well, we should just that for now. Yeah, but I think it would be interesting to have maybe a workshop on this um, mm -hmm. once we are a little bit further. If I see that that is also a thing that have, that is um, of interest in other domains and other archives repositories. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And I'm just looking in the chat. I'm looking at the chat. Aside from lovely comments from people, I will say like, uh, yeah, a suggestion to run another workshop on more dataverse related details. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we noticed that from the comments from the beginning as well. Uh, so I think we'll definitely take that up with our colleagues here who have a little bit more technical background on dataverse. Mm -hmm. And I did think of another answer to the GDPR permission recording question. It doesn't relate particularly, but um, I, I know personally because I've received training on JDP, GDPR and when we talk about it in other projects I work on, it can seem very overwhelming. Um, it does, we do have one uh, staff member who is our GDR, GDPR person. She's our legal person. And she's our person who we can go and ask these questions and she's well versed in what the answer should be. And I would say become familiar with who that person at your institute is, um, because surely there's at least one person, <laughs> if not more, depending on the type of data that you work with. And they can more often than not have the answer that's more applicable to your circumstance. Um, and so really like, because sometimes I find that Googling it just is too much because it's such an all encompassing regulation. And you're like, no, I need to know particularly how this relates to a training that I'm giving that's gonna be distributed online later, et cetera. So yeah, I would yeah. say find out who that person is. <laughs> I think having sort of oftentimes having or following your, the guidelines from your institute is very useful because they will probably have that, or at least they should. I think in particular universities will have some sort of guidelines on this and it's good to look for help there. Okay, so Kim also already shared the survey on the workshop, so we would be really happy if people provide us with feedback. Uh, we will also share this um, later in, a, in another sort of wrap-up email, but if you have time already, then you can do that now. And yeah, this is really the time if you have any remaining questions or need any more advice from us, then this is the time to ask. And I'm very happy that people uh, say it was useful and that, uh, yeah, that we, we really hope you use the materials and do share them with colleagues and everybody you know. Uh, we're really happy if people reuse it. Kim, you're muted. Okay, so that never ends. That that moment will never end as a trainer. You just need to get used to it. No, I would say <laughs> the final uh, recommendation that Ricarda and I can give for any training you give is to schedule more time than you need so that you can end the training early because people appreciate when things end early with, rather than when things run long. That is a very good thing, I think. Yeah, everybody enjoys like extra 15 minutes of break, I think. <laughs> And also, especially if you run over time, a lot of people will just run out and it's not a nice feeling. So um, I think this is very nice. Good advice, Kim. So um, if there are no other questions, then I think we would really like to thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really happy that so many people signed up. We're hoping that many people who couldn't make it today will uh, revisit the materials later. You can always get in touch with us if you have feedback and comments, or if you want to know more about Dataverse or the trainings that we provide. So you can find our emails here and everything is also on Zenodo. We will update the slides and then make a new uh, version of it so that you have the most recent slides on there as well. And I think that's all that I want to say. Do you have some uh, final words, Kim? I do, but I would have to go back all the way to the beginning. Oh. Hold on, because, so 
So thank you to SESDA and also thank you to MK Das, who was a partner uh, they will be writing up about this training. And yeah. Yeah, that's true. Thank you to everybody who was involved in supporting this and making this possible. Yeah, and thanks to everyone here for your great feedback and also answering questions when we couldn't. Yeah, exactly. I was really happy with the active contributions in the chat. Okay, well then, thank you everybody and I hope to see you at the next training or another community event. Mm -hmm.